got back from uh, Sedona, Arizona, one of my most favorite places in the world. They have these incredible vortexes of spiritual energy where people go to gather themselves in a place where the presence of God is really strong. And one of my favorite spots is a place called Bell Rock. Bell Rock. So I'm, I'm climbing up Bell Rock and there are a couple of kids, 20, 30 years old, with cameras and tripods. I now call 20, 30 year olds kids. <laughs> they say to me, excuse me, sir. <laughs> is this the place where the harmonic convergence happened? Uh, in 1987, I said, well, actually, yes, this is the place where the harmonic convergence happened. It, it came, it went, and, and we're all still here. <laughs> Do you get it? We're all still here. It came, it went, and we're all still here. It was that time and that belief that if we all got together in 87, you remember that harmonic convergence time? We all meditated together. All of us at one time got together and sat down on the cushion and meditated and worked with meditation and allowed ourselves to all converge in the idea of awakening. We would help the collective global mind move from the fourth to the fifth dimensional consciousness. Do you remember that time? We were all part of that. And many people are pointing to the 2012 time as a time of that happening as well, too. And, and Sedona is a place that, for years, has gathered all the flower children, the flakes, the people like Maureen and myself, all the folks who came with their crystals and their beads and their chakras and their chanting and the color things, and all of it was there. And we were all there in 1987, waiting for this to happen. My friend Oman, who's the brother of Carl, he was part of making some of those original festivals happen. OK, we're going to switch my mic for a moment. Let's try this now. Yeah. No complaint if you go over 12. 15 minutes off. So we're good now, right? Get back on. And he was part of making those ceremonies happen, some of the beginning ones that were happening. And we were in 1987 sitting on this uh, balcony, which was an apartment we were renting right next to uh, some friends of ours. And we were with a couple of people who were from Scrim in the Washington area. And we were watching Bell Rock about two miles away. And I'm telling you, what we saw was no less than a miracle. We saw a spacecraft landing and taking off yeah. on the top of Bell Rock. We watched and witnessed this for, ooh, it's the twilight zone. We witnessed this for, what, about an hour? Watching him take off and land, and back then I was 37 years old. I had eyesight then, I could, I could, see, I could see the flies, you know, wings fluttering at 50 feet. We were all seeing this happen, and we were going, we are part of this major, huge event that's happening on the planet, the space beings are landing, we're gonna shift from material mortal mind to immortal consciousness, and we're gonna be a part of it, and then our dear friends, my mom and Mia came and came up on the balcony and they popped our bubble. They said, now you see that street lamp right down over there? That street lamp is illuminating bugs. And the bugs are making it look like the space craft. <laughs> there's, no, there's no space thing when it's called space bugs. And I went, space bugs? <laughs> Come on, I want to be here for this huge event shift that's happening in consciousness and all it is is space bubbles. You know, it's not going to be what we think it's going to be. But the shift that we're talking about is not so much an external shift that happens outwardly, but an internal one that happens where? Inside of us. So all the prophecies, the mind calendars and the Bible and the Quran, and all we're going to talk about a time that's coming, an end time, is this time right now. And it's not so much talking about what happens outwardly, but what we choose to do with our own awakening. The part in the Bible I wanted to read is in 1 Corinthians 15. It says this. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The last trumpet will sound. 
And that trumpet will sound, that last trumpet, and the dead will be raised and perishable and will be changed, for the perishable body must put on the imperishable body, and the mortal puts on the immortal body, and it goes on for like 15 minutes, and then it says this, it is written and fulfilled, this scripture, death has been swallowed up in victory, where, O oh, death, is your victory, where, O oh, death, is your sting. Now, when I read that, I went, what the heck does that mean? And then I looked at one word that changed the whole meaning of this whole scripture. One word. I looked at die, and it says CQ. I looked at Q, and the Greek means not die, fall asleep. We will not all fall asleep, but we shall be awakened by the renewal of our minds. That's what this is talking about. It's talking about waking up waking up to who we are, and then the trumpet sounds, and then we are awakened, the harmonic convergence converges on us, and we merge with who we are in those moments, my friends. <sighs> Hallelujah. That's what we're talking about. It happens every day. This particular talk came out of a wonderful article from an incredibly brilliant Buddhist meditation master called Pema Chodron. Does anybody here know Pema Chodron's work? If you don't, pick it up and start reading anywhere. It'll help you in your practice today. And she says in this article, Signs of Spiritual Progress. It can be real tricky when we start taking outer events and looking for it as being a sign for how we're doing inwardly. It can be real tricky when we assign a kind of value to something either that will or won't happen. At the work, it's not about what goes on outwardly, but how we deal with what's going on where. Inwardly, moment by moment, that we show up. If I spent a lot of time looking for signs and wonders in the world, sometimes they'll happen and sometimes they won't. The truth is, the middle way is the Buddhist way. The path somewhere in between make it so and as you wish that I said last week is the middle way and that's dealing with what's going on in your consciousness right now and the work that we do in dealing with that has to do with our own inner look at what the Buddhists call klesias klesha klesha k-l-e-s-a k-l K-L-E-S-H-A-S, -S. klesias, klesias, are strong, conflicting emotions, we'll, we'll figure that out later, right? that spin off and hide when we are caught in aversion or attraction. Kleshas are strong, conflicting emotions that spin off and heighten when we get caught in either something that I want and something that I don't want. The kleshas, klesias, work by grabbing hold of our consciousness and taking over. A good practice is to become curious about what increases clashing activity within you and what diminishes it. Just being aware, well, what is this thing that takes over my consciousness? I just got back from, from being in Sedona, and I always, oh, I love to go to these places where I get really big and expanded and I'm open. And oh my gosh, this is it. I'm never going to forget again. I'm going to remember who I am. I'm going to stay open and expanded. And I know what's going to happen. It happens all the time. Something's going to happen. And I'm going to react and contract around something. And the first time it happens, oh my like, oh no, I fell for it again. And so, why is she in this kind of mood? And why did he say that it's their fault? You understand? That's why. You took my bliss away from me. Nobody can take anything away from you. Why is that happening to you? It's happening through you. In those moments where you get to look at that, you get to go, oh, well, there's, there's that expansion and contracting happening within me. I have a choice right now either expand and be open or contract. And it isn't one or the other. It's developing a relationship with not only your own kleshic activity, which is your own stuff that takes over, but the collective kleshic activity of other people who are involved with the same conflicting emotions that are your work. The work is not what happens outwardly, but looking at those things that bite and sting you inwardly and catching them before you project it out. Just being aware of it while it's a thought before it becomes a word, a deed, and a habit pattern. That's all. And being gentle with yourself when you have days of being able to do that easily. And be gentle with yourself when you don't. Just be aware that the work is not outside. The work is where? You do this all the time. You help people relax, to, right, to get present, to be, to be expansive. 
And then you notice when you're contractive and reactive. You just notice it. And you don't beat yourself up for being in one state or the other. One isn't good or bad. I used to hang out in the extreme thought that, that uh, Holy Spirit, God, is good, expansive, and ego is bad, and contractive, and ugh, ego, and yay, Holy Spirit. And the truth is, that's not the truth. It's both. If you're in a body, your work is with those things that fight and sting you, it'll always be among you. To develop a friendly relationship with that part of yourself, so you stop beating yourself up when you're in one extreme or the other. And a beautiful example of that. I, I was uh, walking around my neighborhood in Lake Forest Park, Forest Park? Lincoln Forest, Lincoln Forest. Yeah. And I was thinking about Sedona and how beautiful it was there. I'm walking, I'm walking. <laughs> This beautiful Lincoln Forest that I'm thinking about somewhere else. Anybody relate to that? Somewhere else, someplace else is better than where I'm at. And I caught myself. Oh, oh, wait a minute. And I just, I opened up and I looked up and there was this amazing, gorgeous sunset happening. Right over here in North Carolina, Wilmington. Beautiful, gorgeous sunset. The clouds and the fingers and the hands of God were reaching out. And I went, this is just, this is beautiful. This is as pretty as anything I've ever seen anywhere in the whole world. I, I'm back, I'm present, I'm expansive. And then I heard children laughing down the corner of the street. So I went, I want to go near where the children are laughing. When I'm in a good place and expansive, I love hearing children giggle and laughing. And they were, they were playing down the street. So I had my dog with me and I'm walking down the street and it's a family sitting and they're having this great time to kind of kick me out in the front lawn and I wave at them. And then all of a sudden this dog comes running out, a pretty good sized dog. And, you know, Havasu is little, so I just pulled Havasu up real quickly and put her in my arms. I know you've done that too, because I don't know whether this dog was going to eat her or not. And went, no, no, no. And then I just put Havasu back down and I kept walking slowly. And from behind me, I hear this voice that says, Hey, buddy, would you mind keeping your dog off my lawn? Hey, buddy, would you mind keeping your dog off my lawn? And I turned around, my classic activity. <laughs> You know, zero to 100. It was Mark Siegel who goes to this church. He points his finger at me and he says, I got you. I got you, baby. Uh -huh. I got you. I got you. He got me. It was so beautiful. He got me. Now, you want to be begotten of the only child? You want to be begotten of God? You've got to be able to get me. Get me, man. Get me. What, what catches you? What hooks you? He got me. And we just stood there, both of us, belly up, laughing. It was so beautiful. I, I turned right away, and there was God. You see, the friend is everywhere. Because the one you love lives inside of all beings. Sometimes it comes in the form of, hey buddy, hey you, hey you with this particular strong opinion, hey you with this attraction or aversion, hey you buddy, I'm here to remind you, take a look at who's here. It's the friend who lives inside of all beings. And I just, I just laughed and laughed and Beth came out and the kids came out. All the dogs came out, they're all licking each other. They're all fine. The problem was with my own consciousness, right? You notice the tension in yourself. Tension. Reaction, ah, pull back, oh, I can expand. It's the friend again, showing herself to me in this beautiful form that I can relate to now within the world. I don't need to collapse around this. I can open up and be expansive. And every time you do that, the trumpet sounds once again. In that moment, there is a harmonic convergence. You think these moments are small. I'm telling you they're much bigger than any of us think. She says it so beautifully this way. We're talking about on this path. Kamachoka, about a gradual awakening, a gradual learning process by looking deeply and compassionately about how we're affecting others with our speech and our actions. Very slowly, we begin to acknowledge what is happening to us. We begin to see when, for example, we are starting to harden our view, spin a story, and then create a situation, and usually make someone wrong. Anybody ever do this today, this morning, two minutes ago? We begin to be able to acknowledge when we are blaming people and when we are afraid and pulling back, or when we are completely tense, or when we can't soften, and when we can't refrain from saying something harsh to somebody else. We become aware of that in us. The process by which we do this in the Buddhist terminology is called maitri. It's, it's kind of touching an unconditional friendliness with ourself. An un Conditional friendliness with ourself. Can you be friendly to yourself? It's the hardest person in the world to cut some slack with. 
is yourself, particularly those of us who like to beat ourselves up with our spiritual truths and principles. Yes? Learning how to be friendly with yourself. So whatever happens, you can meet it with unconditional openness towards whatever might arise. Again and again throughout the day, you acknowledge what's happening in you with a bit more gentleness and honesty and compassion. That's a harmonic convergence, friends. In that moment, you merge with who you are. And the friendlier you can be, and the most familiar person you can be familiar with, is going to always be who? You, to know your top ten tunes and not keep having to play them over and over and over and over and over again. They're not that different from yesterday as they are today as they will be tomorrow. Becoming friendly with yourself and being open and spacious and being able to, to hear God laughing. <laughs> because my friends, God is laughing. The saddest day on earth, of course, a miracle says, is when the sons and daughters of God forgot to laugh. This gradual awakening process is happening right here and now with every step we take. Of course, a miracle says the time it takes to awaken is shorter by far than the time it's taken us to fix our mind firmly on illusions. So every step you take in this direction, no matter how poorly you practice, is met by the friend who smiles and says, good job, brushes your shoulders and says, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing one of my favorite practices that I have not done for about 20 years in Sedona. How many here have ever tried to dissolve clouds? You ever do the dissolve cloud thing in the light on? How many here? Remember that? It was a big thing for a while. And so I figured, what better place than Sedona to lie down and dissolve clouds? It's the only place I know on the planet where you can lie down in the middle of the street in Sedona and be dissolving clouds. And people walk by you and say, oh, dissolving clouds, good for you. Here's a t-shirt. Here's my card. If you want to do a workshop, I've got a DVD. I've got to do this right. Sedona, you know, whatever, whatever nutty thing you're into, everybody in Sedona is there with you, so it's wonderful. So I'm, I'm finding a place to, to lie down and do my dissolving cloud ceremony. I'm, on a beautiful spot in Red Rock Crossing. And so I just, I just lie down like this, and you just, ah, oh, you just lie down and you notice, you notice the sky. And the Buddhists say that, that the closest thing towards God that they know of is called God is the endless sky. The spaciousness of your mind is huge and vast and knows no limitations. And the truth is the clouds are the thought formations and the habit patterns that just pass on by. And so when you do this technique, what you do is you look at those things that float by, you look at those cloud formations with soft eyes, and then you begin to notice what's behind it. You begin to focus on what's behind it. And, and then that thing that, that you're holding on to, that tissue, that issue, that clashing activity, it begins to dissolve, and you evolve into who you are. In that moment, my friends, I'm talking heaven on earth. Where? Right here and right now, when you're able to stay that present with what's going on. Wow! And then there'll be times when you can, and there'll be times when you can't. There'll be times when the whole screen, the whole sky of your consciousness is going to be filled with storms and lightning and thunder and earthquakes. What do you think is going on now on our planet with our environment? It's acting out our own inner thoughts and feelings. The collective Kalshik mind, the race mind, the ancient mind of our consciousness is coming back and showing us what we have been doing with our consciousness and giving us an opportunity to work with ourselves. And every time you do do that, you do make that choice to work with yourself, to catch it early, to catch it before it becomes a huge storm or you start throwing lightning bolts at other people. You catch it inside of you. You watch it evolve and dissolve into who you truly know. In that moment, we see heaven on earth being made known right here and right now. That's the moment that we keep coming back to over and yet over and over again. So again, just one more thing up here. Let's just take a look at one concept at the end of our lesson summation. It's point number three. I want to really bring this back to you again. What happens when we do this practice is we begin, point number three, to touch unconditional friendliness within ourselves. Again, which is called matri. And unconditional openness towards whatever might arise again and again and again Throughout the day, we acknowledge what's happening with a bit more gentleness, a bit more honesty, and a bit more compassion, and a bit more love. Yeah? That's what we need to do. Yeah, look around now. We can be friendlier with ourselves than we've been. We've been harsh. We've been judging ourselves. 
It's time to acknowledge that which doesn't judge and which loves us truly as we are. So I wanted to just close with this lovely poem that Maureen read. It calls What Happens. Let's come back to it. What happens when your soul begins to awaken, your eyes and your heart and the cells of your body to the great journey of love? First, there is a wonderful laughter <laughs> and possible precious tears. I do both of that while I'm here. I cry and I laugh. And a hundred sweet promises and those heroic vows no one can ever keep. But still God is delighted and amused. You once tried to be a saint. What happens when your soul begins to awaken this world? To our deep need to love and serve the friend. Oh, beloved, you will begin to be sent wonderful, wild companions who will come in the form of... <laughs> Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. You know, you got your hey, buddy, don't you? Someone's, someone's got your back. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. And you turn around and you see the friend immediately. You turn around and see God right away. You get it. <laughs> Trumpet sound. Hallelujah. That moment is called heaven on earth. The gradual awakening process will keep sending you buddies and good friends to help you do just that. Please, my friends, during this incredibly important time on the planet, practice well. Practice deeply, not just for yourself, but for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Namaste. Namaste.